بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى بالقاسم محمد الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله السلام عليك يا غريب كربلاء رزقنا الله في الدنيا زيارتكم وشفاعتكم في الدنيا والآخرة أما بعد فمما جاء في زيارة سيدنا ومولانا الإمام الكاظم صلوات الله وسلامه عليه السلام عليك يا نور الله في ظلمات الأرض صلوا على محمد وآل محمد الله صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجه We are commemorating tonight the martyrdom, the shahada of the seventh imam from the school of Ahlul Bayt salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'een and that is al-imam Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim صلوات الله وسلامه عليه اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى محمد In a long hadith found in one of our prominent books of hadith كتاب الكافي In fact at the beginning of it there is a long discussion an educational conversation between Imam Al-Kadhim عليه السلام and one of his students, and the student of Imam al-Sadiq by the name of Husham ibn al-Hakam. Husham ibn al-Hakam was a person who was well versed in knowledge. And Imam al-Kadhim was discussing with him about the importance of the intellect, al-aql. This is something important, very important in the religion of Islam. I have not found it in any other religion and makes it really unique to Islam. The power of reason in proving the usul al deen the roots of our religion. And that's why in Kitab al-Kafi, the book of Hadith I mentioned, which is one of our predominant books of Hadith, one of the four main books of traditions, it's at the very beginning of the book. Usul al-Kafi, if you just turn on a few pages, you'll find the section of the aql, the reason, the intellect. Because I have not found yet in my discussions with different faiths, people of different religions, this concept where you prove everything through reason. For example, in a discussion I had once with a father, it was here, right here in fact, a father who was a Catholic professor. He called me once and he said, I want to bring my students here so you can teach them about Islam. These are graduate students and instead of me teaching them, you can teach them. This is at a college nearby. These were all graduate students. So this Catholic, he brings his 
students and we have a discussion. I start introducing Islam to them. One thing important, of course, in Islam is the concept of Tawheed, monotheism, that God is one. God cannot be divided. God cannot be personified. He cannot be seen. It's impossible to see God. The minute you see him, if that is, you know, for example, hypothetically speaking, if you can see something, it means it's physical. It means it cannot be at two places at the same time. It's confined in time and space. So that is something very important. God cannot be divided, has no partners, has no children. And that's something logical. So this father replies and says, well, it's the same thing in our faith. I inquired from him. I said, can you clarify for me one thing? Isn't the concept of Trinity, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, isn't that an integral root faith and belief in Catholicism? He said, yes. I said, to the best of my knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, that is not a logical concept. That is more of a faith-based concept. In other words, logically, it is impossible to prove that there are three and the three are one. And his reply was, yes, you're right. It's a faith-based concept. So if it's an integral part of the faith and it cannot be proven through reason, through logic, you'll have a problem. And I have personally met few Catholics, for example, who have become Muslims. And the reason they turned into Islam was this exact concept, the concept of Tawheed, monotheism, that God is one, cannot be divided. Because they say to me, and one of them became a sheikh now, he's a sheikh actually, became a Muslim back in the 80s, then became a follower of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam and now, mashallah, he's a sheikh. He was telling me the story. He said the concept, you know, and, and he was 16 years old, by the way. He was 16 years old when he became a follower of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam at that young age. He said the concept of monotheism, tawheed, that God cannot be divided made sense to me. As a Catholic, that did not make sense to me, that three are one and one is three. I couldn't digest it. This is something important. And you find Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam played a crucial role despite the difficult conditions and times they lived in, in teaching the religion as per the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the teachings of our Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They preserved the teachings of Rasulullah and they expanded on the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. What I mean by expanded, of course, it's not something that they introduced themselves from nowhere. It is based on the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, our Holy Prophet, but remember, our Prophet's message was only 23 years. People did not experience all kinds of problems during these 23 years. New issues started to arise after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Especially at the time of Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, Imam al-Rida. At that time, the Greek philosophies now started to be introduced in the Muslim world. The books of Plato, Aristotle now are translated and people now are reading them. And things are getting confused now. Things are getting confusing. About different theologies, different philosophies, different ideologies. Ahlul Bayt السلام, played a very integral role in teaching and maintaining the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You find Imam al-Sadiq having 4,000 students documented by name in the book called Mawsu'atul Imam al-Sadiq, the encyclopedia of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. By started, that encyclopedia was started by Marhum late Sayyid Muhammad Kazum al-Qazwini but he couldn't finish it. He died, unfortunately, halfway through. So his children finished it under his name. They documented the name of all the 4,000, 4,000 students of Imam al-Sadiq, 
Imam al kazim alayhi salam, and we'll speak a little bit about him. I read today a reference. He had 319, 319 scholars of religion that were taught under him, through him, salamullahi alayhi. So this is something important. Today, in fact, one of the students asked me, said, what is the difference, you know, why is the Bible, for example, why does it differ in the teachings, in some cases, from the Holy Quran? I said three main reasons. Three main reasons. One, the Bible was written 30 years after Isa, after Jesus. It was not written during his time. Whereas the Quran was written during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Whenever the Prophet would receive a revelation, an ayah, he would call upon Imam Ali Salamullahi Alayhi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the Kutab of the Wahi, those people who used to write down. He says, write down these verses. So they would write down the verses of the Quran. And therefore, at the end of his life, that famous hadith that we quote, we say, I am leaving amongst you two things, the book of Allah and what else? My family, my progeny. Okay. What's interesting is he's saying a book of Allah or the book of Allah. There is a book. There is already a book. Otherwise, Muslims would have said, where is that book? Which book are you talking about? No, it was not just memorized, but rather it was written and was preserved with Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi. He kept it. After the death of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, even all Muslims, all Muslims agree. Imam Ali, they say he did not come to the bay'ah of the first khalifa their reason is because he spent the time making sure the Qur'an is not altered. That's their interpretation. Because he really cared about the Qur'an, that it does not get altered. So he stayed at home and did not pay his allegiance to the first Khalifa until later. That's what they say. So that's one difference. Qur'an was written at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, under his guidance and was looked after by Amirul Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi, whereas the Injil, the Bible, was written 30 years after Isa, salamullahi alayhi. That's one. Second main difference. The Bible was written in what language? Do you guys know? No, it wasn't written in Aramaic, interestingly. The Bible was written in Greek. The first version of the Bible was written in Greek. But that was not the language that Isa spoke. Isa spoke Aramaic. Which means the first version of the written Bible was what? A translation. And you can't have a translation. You can always... A translation means interpretation. It's like you have the Quran in English. That's why one of the writers, one of the writers of the Quran... He, has a, he translated the Qur'an, sorry, one of the translators of the Qur'an, Arthur Arbery. Arthur Arbery, he did not call his Qur'an a translation. He said the Qur'an interpreted. He said because you cannot translate the Qur'an. القمر, how would you translate that? You know, the time has come and the moon has split, for example. That, that sometimes there are certain verses that you cannot translate. So you have to interpret them. Otherwise, they wouldn't make sense to translate so if the Bible was revealed, or Isa alayhi salam, Jesus spoke Aramaic, and the first version of the Bible that was written was in Greek, what does that tell you? Right there, off the bat, you have a translation. You have an interpretation. Okay. That's the second difference. The third is some people utilize that difference in the interpretation to change a few things, to add a few things, and that is, interestingly, the whole essence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because the Father in the Aramaic language does not mean Father, like the Father as the Father and Son-Father relationship. No, Father means the nourisher. Like in Arabic, we say, Rabbul Usra. You know, the Father, Al-Ab, Rabbul Usra. He's like the nourisher of the family. He's the sustainer of the family. The take that was the meaning. And same thing with the Son and the Holy Spirit translations. So these are three main differences between we have what we see the Bible and the Quran. Ahlul Bayt alayhim clarified these. That's why, for example, 
you'll find there are many discussions of Imam al rida alayhi salam with Christian theologians, with Jewish theologians. He sits down and discusses. And these are documented. You can refer to one reference, Kitab al-Ihtijaj by Tabrasi, narrates it, and Kitab Uyun Akhbar al rida by Sheikh al-Saduq Radwan Allah Ta'ala alayhi. It has a whole bunch of these discussions. So Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam played an integral role to resist the changes and alterations introduced into the religion. And that's why the title of our discussion today, Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, the resistance. First resistance is against changes and alterations of the religion. For example, when he was a young child, Abu Hanif and Nu'man, the Imam of the Hanafi, uh, Hanafi Madhab, the Hanafis today, Abu Hanifa comes to visit Imam al Sadiq. He sits in a majlis like this. People are sitting down, and a young boy comes into the majlis. People start getting up and shaking the hand of this young boy. He asks a person, Who is he? He says, This is Musa. He's the son of Ja'far. He's the son of the Imam. He says, why are people standing up to him like this? You know, he's a boy. He says, no, he's not just an ordinary boy. This boy has so much knowledge. He said, come on, what could a boy have? I'll go ask him and humiliate him. He says, don't, because you will be humiliated. He says, no, come on, what good does he know? So he comes to him. He says, young man, tell me, Sin, is it from the person, the human being, or from God? Who's responsible? This is the ideologies of Abu Hanifa. The human being has no free will. The human being has no free will. Allah makes him sin. That's his ideology. So he comes and asks Imam al kadhim who is responsible for the sin when a person sins? Is it God or the person? And the whole idea, the whole idea behind it, why, why do they have this discussion? How come that discussion is there already? Yes, there are verses in the Quran, for example, that they don't understand. The second thing is they say, how could the person sin against the will of Allah? Billah. Yani if God does not want me to sin, but I sin, doesn't that make me also as powerful as Allah? Billah? That's their problem. How could God not want me to sin? If God doesn't want me, if God doesn't want me to pick this up, I cannot pick it up. But I do pick it up. Well, that makes God billah, not so powerful anymore. Billah, God forbid. You see the problem? That's their problem. What they don't realize is that God gave me the ability, but gave me the intellect, the aql, to think. And God taught me what's right and what's wrong. Then he will judge me. He gave me the power. And he is capable of taking that power away from me anytime he wants. Just like when our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sallallahu ala Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wanted to migrate from Mecca to Medina. When he came out of the house, there were 40 men surrounding the house. All those men, they had good, clear vision. What we call today 2020 vision. But what happened? You guys familiar with the story? What happened? Did they see the Prophet? How? When they were seeing each other, he could see you and you and you, but then the Prophet walks by. Cannot, so how is that possible? Because Allah now put the stop button, for example, if you may say so, on their ability to see Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Why? For the protection of the religion. The religion needs to be protected. If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would have been killed that day, or that night, the religion would have been incomplete. To protect the religion, to complete the religion, he had to protect him. So God took the power. He has. He gives the power. And therefore, he is the one in control. But at the same time, he teaches, he educates, and he lets the people make their decision through their intellect and through the teachings of the prophets. Okay? That's what they didn't understand. So this Abu Hanifa is asking the Imam, who is responsible for sin? The human or God, he says it's one of three. It can't be anymore. Either it is God, Allah is responsible for our sin, but that is impossible because if God were, you know, responsible for me sinning, 
it would be unfair for him to put me in the fire. And God is fair, adil. Therefore, it is impossible that he makes me commit the sin. That's one. Two, it's either partnership, God and the person, both. This means it's, a, it's an associate, joint crime. God forbid. God and the person, the human, both. Both are guilty. And he says that would also not be possible because God is powerful and I am weak. The human is weak. So for the powerful to punish the weak, that would be unfair. Again, that would make God unfair. And that cannot be. Therefore, that leaves us with the third option. And who is responsible for the sin? The human being. And therefore, God gave him an intellect, aql, with which he can distinguish what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. The human being chooses, God forbid, to take drugs. People are told, do not take drugs. It will destroy you. It will ruin you. You choose to take drugs. You choose to destroy your life. And therefore, they will be responsible for your actions. The human being is told, you have to pray. You choose to pray or not to pray. That's your choice. It's up to you. And therefore, the sin is from the person. He chooses. So that is one resistance. Resistance against false ideologies. And that is an important role, a very important role. That's one. Two, resistance against oppression. Resistance against oppression. Ahlul Bayt salam, lived through difficult times, especially during the Abbasid's time. The Abbasid's time, difficult time. To the point where at the time of Imam al-Sadiq salam, when the Abbasid came to power, Imam al-Sadiq to protect some of his own companions like Zurara. Zurara ibn Ayun is one of the best companions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. One of the ulama. To protect him, to save him, Imam al-Sadiq one day puts him down. Puts him down. Zurara's son comes to visit Imam al-Sadiq one day. And says, and Imam al-Sadiq asks him, we haven't seen your father for time. He said, Ya ibn Rasulullah, how could my father come after what you said about him? So he's been living in guilt. What has he done that he, that you said this about him? He said, tell your father, we only said that to protect him. Because the eyes were turning towards him. What we did, are you guys familiar with Surah Al-Kahf and the story of Musa and Al-Khidr alayhi salam? You remember, you're familiar with that story? What was the first thing that uh, Khidr did, the Prophet Khidr alayhi salam did? The first thing, when they went, he did three things. What was the first thing he did? The ship. The ship. The ship. He broke the ship. Correct? He damaged the ship. Why? Did To sink it? No. What did he want to do? To protect it. They were pirates. There was a king, a king who unfortunately, although he was a king, rich, but you know, we see some rich people today, like that president, for example. Subhanallah. The rich become more thief, you know, than the poor. You know, subhanallah. You're, he's a king. There was a king behind. So as a king, mashallah, you have so many ships. Why do you want to go to this ship? But subhanallah, he wants, you know, every penny, whatever he wants, he can get. Some kings, like we see in today's world. So a king was after them. He wanted to seize their ship. So Khidr explained later to Musa. He explains to him, I damaged it, but it was a calculated damage. A calculated damage. It would not sink it. That damage would only give it a problem, make water leak through it, but it would not sink it. And that's exactly what he did. So it was a calculated damage. So Imam as sadiq tells the son of Zurara, go tell your father, that was exactly what we did. We just damaged that ship, but it was a calculated damage. So that he doesn't get sunk. No. The enemies don't prison him, don't kill him. So can you imagine? And that's why this is something very important. I just want to clarify it here. We have some writers today who write in some books. They say, look at some of those narrators and companions of the imams. Some of them were dissed by the imam himself. And they would narrate such a hadith. What the problem is, they don't narrate the other hadith that I just narrated. That why did imam do this? So they give a half picture, a false picture. 
about our madhab because they say, look, these are the big narrators of the Shia and they were dissed by the Imams themselves. And they give several examples. But they were not dissed by the Imam because they were bad. They were dissed just to protect them. The same thing you read about Bahlul, Bahlul al sayrafi al-Kufi, one of the Shia. Two narrations are said about him. One, Harun al-Rashid wanted to appoint him as a judge in his state. And he didn't want to be a judge in that state. It's a state of corruption. What can he judge about? All wrong things. So he pretended that he has lost his mind. Another narration says Harun wanted a fatwa, you know, a ruling from him that it is permissible to kill Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Just like Yazid, for example, got fatwa from some people that it is permissible to kill Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He wanted a fatwa. That's what. So to avoid the fatwa, he pretended that he lost his mind. So can you imagine Sahaba, companions, ulama, one of them gets this, for example, by the Imam to protect him. The other one pretends he's sick, uh, he's, he's mad to protect himself, and so on and so forth. You can see how difficult the state was. Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam was imprisoned so many times. Put in prison several times. Not just during Harun's time, during Al Mahdi al Abbasi's time, others, especially Harun's brother who was the Khalifa before him. He ruled for one year. His name was Musa al Hadi, the, the Khalifa. Musa al Hadi. One year. During this one year, there was a revolution by the Hassanis, the children of Imam al Hassan. A man by the name of Al Hussein ibn Ali, ibn al Hassan. One of the grandsons, Al Hussein, and interestingly, his mother's name is Zainab. His mother's name is Zainab. Hussein ibn Ali rose in a revolution and he was captured along with 100 people from Bani Hashim, from the Alawis. Alawis, we mean the children of Amir al Mu'mineen. 100 were all killed. Then they took the women and the children as prisoners to the Khalifa, Al Hadi al Abbasi, and Hadi told them, Kill them all. Did not even spare the women and the children. Yazid at least, you know, he did not kill the women and the children. At least. This guy did not even spare the women and the, he said, finish them all. So they killed. That's why Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam said, the biggest tragedy for us, Ahlul Bayt, after Ashura, after Imam Hussein, is this tragedy of Fakh, known as the tragedy of Fakh. That was the battle of Fakh in an area which is part, today is part of Mecca. Today is part of Mecca. And those people were all muhrimin. They have gone to Umrah or gone, gone to Hajj. Sorry, they were gone to Hajj. They were killed on the eighth day of the Hijjah. They were all in Ahram. They captured them, they fight against them, and they kill them all. Okay. So Imam al kadhim lived in that. Now when you have a revolution against the state, and that revolution is by the Hassanis, and the state captures it, what will the state do to all those people who are the children of Hassan and Hussein? They will tie a tight grip on them. So Imam al kadhim lived under such very difficult conditions. Executions, persecutions, revolutions, and so on and so forth. He was put in so many times in prison, salam Allah. Yet, some of the historians say that sometimes he would make connections with the prisoners to allow his Shia to come and visit him so that he can teach them and leak news to the Shia. So despite this difficult condition, he lived the resistance against the oppressors. Resistance against oppression. Third resistance is against the love of dunya. Don't be indulged so much in dunya. That's a, that's a tragedy we have today. That person who is almost now eight years old, he's over eight years old now. Look at him. How he's ruling, how he's leading, as if he's going to live forever. Every time he writes a tweet, you know, and the, you know, the stock markets plummet or they raise and whatever. Every time. What do you think? Subhanallah. People just don't realize about the consequences, that life is not going to be forever. One of his companions by the name of Ali ibn Yaqtin, who became, who was a Shia and became the minister of Harun al-Rashid, became a very highly position. One day Ali ibn Yaqtin comes to the Imam, Salamullah alayhi, and he says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, how about if I quit? No, I am being the minister to Harun. He is oppressing the Shia, he's killing the Shia. I can't stop him. Imam told him no. Stay in that post. Stay in that post. But I want you to guarantee me one thing. If you guarantee me one thing, I guarantee you three things. Listen to this. 
what is the one thing? He says, I want you to guarantee me that every time one of our awliya, one of our Shia, comes to you for help, you help them and you honor them. Tukrimuhu wa tuhsinu ilayh. Means you honor them and you help them. Whenever a Shia comes to you asking for help, two things. Don't put up, you know, a WhatsApp that so-and-so has just come and he's asking for help and you disgrace the person. Don't say his name. Don't embarrass him. Don't shame him. Don't insult him. Don't hurt him. Whenever a Shia comes to you, honor him and respect his integrity and dignity and finish his job. Fulfill his need. You guarantee me this one thing. Subhanallah, the Imam did not tell him, go pray Salatul Layl, that's what I want from you. He did not go tell him, go fast the month of Rajab and Sha'ban and Ramadan, all three months together. That's important. But respecting the Shia is not any less important. You guarantee me that one thing. What will Imam guarantee? Three things. First, you will never go to prison. You will never be imprisoned. Second, the sword will never come to you. Harun will never, in other words, Harun will not find out that you're a Shia. He will not find out. In other words, he won't be killed. That's two, you won't be executed. Two, third, you'll never go poor. So don't you think that when you help a Shia, a mu'min, when you help somebody, don't think that, you know, I'm going to become poor. No. no, if you have some, help. These three things. Imam wanted to teach him, don't be attracted to your position I'm the minister. No, be careful, Ali, Ali ibn Yaqtin. Be careful. Be a mu'min, muttaqi. Go against this dunya. And in fact, unfortunately, this love of dunya is what made, what caused the imprisonment of the Imam, sallallahu alayhi Harun al-Rashid, the Khalifa, Harun al-Rashid, the Khalifa, he had a son, Muhammad al-Amin, you know, who became the, Khalifa after him. And of course he had Abdullah al-Ma'moon. He gave the Khilafah, he assigned that Muhammad al-Amin will become the Khalifa. خلاص. Because his mother was from Bani Hashim. She was the daughter of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. Or the granddaughter of Abu Ja'far al-Mansur. So the cousin of Harun. They were cousins. So Muhammad al-Amin will become the Khalifa. Muhammad al-Amin was raised, was taken care of by a man called Ja'far. Okay, Ja'far. Harun, during his time, there were some ministers who became very powerful. The last name of these ministers was the Barmaki, Barmaki, the Baramika. Baramika became very powerful at the time of Harun al Rashid. They would become rich, wealthy, influential. One of those men, Baramika, by the name of Yahya, he became jealous of Ja'far, the one who raised Muhammad al Amin. He thought to himself, if Al-Amin becomes the Khalifa, he's close to Ja'far, so what is he going to do? He's going to give most of the power to Ja'far, and I will be left out of the equation. Okay. So we have to do something here to make Harun not like Ja'far. Okay. What can we do? He tried several things, they didn't work. So finally, to get closer to Harun to tell him that I really care about your power, your Khilafah. He asked, he said, is there anyone from the children of Al-Hassan or Al-Hussein, Al-Alawi, is there a Alawi who loves dunya, he loves money? Is there somebody? They told him yes. Who? Ali ibn Ismail ibn al-Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. Ali, the son of Ismail, the eldest son of Imam al-Sadiq. Ismail, that's what branched off the Ismailis, today Ismailis. Of course, Ismail was a mu'min, a muttaqi. We even do his ziyara in Baqi' when we go to Baqi'. He died during the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. His son Ali, Ali ibn Ismail, unfortunately, he had the love of dunya. Although he is the son of Imam, or the grandson of the Imam, he's a Sayyid, what we call today a Sayyid, subhanallah. So Yahya, Yahya al-Barmaki, he invites this man, Ali ibn Ismail ibn al-Imam al-Sadiq. He goes to Mecca, he invites him, he speaks with him. He says, listen, I will pay you a lot of money, lots of money, 
if you go to Harun and you tell him that your uncle Musa has an interest in becoming the Khalifa. He wants to become, he wants to take your position. And he's got influence, so he can do it. You do that, I'll give you lots of money. He agreed with him, unfortunately. So he went back to Medina. This Ali ibn Ismail packed up his bags and was about to leave to Baghdad. Imam al kazim calls him. He says, come here. He says, where do you want to go? He says, I have some business. He says, what do you need the business for? He says, I have debt. He said, I will pay your debt. What do you need? What else do you need? Uh, well, I, I need money. I'll give you money. What else do you need? Stay here. Don't go. He said, no, no, no. I have to go. He says, don't go. He says, no. He insisted, and he got up. Before he leaves, Imam Salamullah Alayhi gave him 4,000 silver coins. Gave him a lot of money. So 4,000 silver coins at the time was a lot of money. Plus 200 golden coins. 200 gold coins, 4,000 silver coins. He said, take this. Khudha wala tutim awladi. He says, take it and don't make my children yatim, orphans. Take it. Take this money, but don't make my children orphans. Subhanallah. This man goes to Harun al-Rashid, as if he learns, subhanAllah. Imam al kazim after he left, he turned to his people who were sitting around him. He said, this man is going to be the reason for my arrest. But he will not enjoy it, subhanAllah. Because I hear it from my fathers, from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When you make a connection to one of your relatives, but he severs that connection. You make an attempt. You pick up the phone to call him. Salamu alaikum, alaikum salam. Oh, why are you calling me? But he hangs up. For example, wal-iyadu billah. You make an attempt to connect with your relative, but that relative severs that connection, then Allah will sever his life as well. You know, his life would be severed. He says, so his life is going to be severed now. I made a connection. I gave him money, but he severed his life. Anyways, he goes to Harun. He tells him, Harun, Salamu alaykum, alaykum as -salam. He says, do you know that there is more than one Khalifa in this state? I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, my uncle, people come and they greet him as a Khalifa, as an Amir al He says, what do you mean? He says, you know, people bring him lots of money, khums money, lots of money. So my uncle is very rich, very wealthy. <coughs> when Harun hears this, <coughs> He thinks this is the nephew of the imam. But, you know, this is trustworthy resources, you know, source. So he gives him 200,000 dirham. He says, this is a gift. Well done. Thank you for letting me know. He says, okay. He says, I'm going to go rest at the place and bring the money to me. <clears throat> he goes into that place. He goes to the washroom. In the washroom, billah, his stomach falls out. Billah, falls out of his body. So he gets up from the washroom, goes to the bed. They come to him. He's in his final moments with the money. He said, we brought you the money. He said, what am I going to do with the money now? I'm losing my life. So they take the money back to Harun al-Rashid, subhanAllah. And he dies right there. He lost dunya and akhirah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajil hujah. So then... Harun goes to Medina. Imam al kazim alayhi salam is praying in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He is praying, Allahu Akbar. He's doing salat. In the middle of the salat, the police, the soldiers, they come and they arrest him right in the middle of his salat. I have seen this with my own eyes in these days. When I go to Hajj, I have seen it with my own eyes in the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And in the Holy Kaaba, people are in the middle of their Salat. They don't even allow them to finish their Salat, those people that we see. These are basically, the, I call them the children of Harun. No, these are the children of Harun. You know. You know, the same, same deed, same action, exactly. That's what Harun did. This is what those people are doing today. You know. In the middle of the Salat, I've seen with my own eyes. They don't even let them. I told them, one time, one time I told them, let him at least finish his Salat. He said, none of your business, go. You know, al billah. In the middle of the Salat, they capture the Imam Salamullah Ali and they drag him out of the masjid of Rasulullah, his grandfather's masjid. 
So as they drag him, they pass by the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Imam al-Kadhim looks at the qabr and he says, As-salamu alayka ya jaddah. He says, oh my, father, my grandfather, bear witness to what those people, ishhad ala ha'ula al-qawm. Bear witness what they're doing right there to your grandson in your own masjid. So they capture Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And you know, subhanallah, Harun then comes to the qabr of Rasulullah, sits there and says, you know, forgive me, my cousin. Forgive me for doing what I have to do. But, you know, I don't want the, your nation, your ummah to split. This is how he justifies it. That this man, your son, is causing the split of your nation. He's dividing your nation. I don't want them to be divided. That's why I'm doing this. Subhanallah. They capture the imam, salamullahi alayhi. They take him out. And it is difficult to leave Medina. It is very difficult to leave Medina for Rasulullah, for, for the children of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You know, these days is also the days when Imam al Hussein left Medina. It is narrated when he wanted to leave Medina, he sat on the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the whole night. None of them left Medina by choice. By choice, none of them left. Imam al Hussein was, did, not by choice did he leave Medina. Imam al-Riba alayhi salam, the son of Imam al-Kawim, it is said three times that night when it was his last night to leave Medina, you know, he had to go to Khurasan, three, three times he would go to the qabr of Rasulullah, sit on the qabr, speak to Rasulullah, cry, gets up, he's about to leave, he couldn't, he comes back and sits again. Again, sits down and talks to us the whole night, three times. It's difficult. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam also, when he wanted to leave Medina, he sat on the qabr of Rasulullah talking to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, this is what your nation is doing to me. And it is also narrated in the middle of the night when no one was watching. He goes to the qabr of his mother Fatima, salamullahi alayha. He also sat on the qabr of his mother Fatima. And he had a conversation with his mother Fatima, salamullahi alayha. That's al Imam al Hussein, salamullahi alayha. So they capture Imam al Kadhim. They take him to Basra. They put him in the prison there. In the prison, and the governor of Basra is the cousin of Harun, his cousin. And also the sister, the brother of his wife, the brother of Zubaydah, the brother of the wife of Harun. So he's the governor of Basra. They put the Imam in his house for one year. Then Harun tells him, kill him. He says, no, I'm not going to kill him. Keep him in my house, under house arrest, I'll do so. But I won't kill him, you know. So he says, okay, if that is the case, now he couldn't, Harun couldn't do anything to him because he's cousin and the brother of his wife. So he couldn't harm him. So he said, okay, خلاص, then send him to Baghdad. So they send the imam to Baghdad. In Baghdad, he sits in the house of one of the ministers, Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah. Again, for about a year, he says, stays there. In the house of Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah, one of the ministers. One of the people by the name of Abdullah, he says, I came to visit Al-Fadl ibn Rabi' one day. We sat at an elevation, like for example up there, you know, we sat up there. And then Fadl ibn Rabi' the minister, he says, look down, what do you see? So I look down, he says, I see a piece of abaya, you know, just a abaya, a rug basically, some, some rug is on the, on the ground. He says, no, 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 look carefully, look what do you see? He says, I looked carefully, I said, this. it seems somebody's in sujood. You know, when I read that riwayah, I was wondering what state was the imam in, salamullahi alayhi, that this man could not even tell that there is a man in sujood. And subhanallah, I don't know what state was the imam in, how much pain he was in, how much food he was lacking in eating, such that he became so thin probably that he couldn't even tell that there is someone in sujood. He says, I see someone in sujood. He says, yes, this is Mawlaq. This is your Mawla. He says, who's my Mawla? He says, don't hesitate. I know. He says, no, who's my Mawla? I don't have a Mawla. He says, this is Musa ibn Ja'far. He says, this is the way he's been since he's come to my house. He, after Fajr, praise Fajr, then goes into sujood all the way until dhuhr. I think he slept, but I see him getting up and immediately praying dhuhr, which means he never slept. That whole time he was in sujood. Then he prays asr. 
After Asr, again he goes to sujood. Until the time of Maghrib. Gets up. Prays Salatul Maghrib. Then does Ibadah. Prays Isha. After Isha, we bring him some food. He eats a couple of bites. Then he takes a quick nap. He wakes up. Does his wudu. And again does Ibadah the whole night until Fajr. This is his state since he's been at my house. Then this Abdullah tells Al-Fadl ibn Rabi'ah, do not kill him. Huh? It will have a consequence. He says, I know. Harun has asked me to kill him several times, but I have refused. So then they transfer him to another house. This time Al-Fadl ibn Yahya al-Barmaki. Yahya al-Barmaki, the one who paid Ali ibn Ismail. His son, Al-Fadl. Al-Fadl, his son, again the same thing. Harun one day comes to visit Al-Fadl ibn Yahya al-Barmaki. He says, where is Musa al-Kadhim? He says, look at him. He sees him in the state of sujood. He says, this is the way he has been since he's come to my house. Harun said, he is like the priest of Bani Hashim. This man, Harun. Rahibu Bani Hashim. You know, about Imam al kaba Then Harun orders Al-Fadl ibn Yahya al-Barmaki to kill him. Again, he refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to kill him. So as a consequence, Al-Fadl gets whipped 100 lashes. Al-Fadl is a bit weaker in status. So he whips him 100 lashes because he refused to kill Imam al kaba So then they transfer him to the prison of As-Sindi ibn Shahik. Sindi, that was a proper prison. Underground, no lights. The Imam is put in heavy chains, billah, and he's kept there. And he was kept there, and the conditions were very tight on the Imam, salam Allahi alayhi. Very tight. The Imam Salamullah never gave up hope from Allah's mercy. Continued to pray. Continued to ask Allah. Brothers and sisters, we can think like Imam al kadhim Difficulties, problem, problems that we face in dunya, think of them as blessings. Blessings that Allah wants to elevate our status with in the akhirah. And increase our reward or decrease our sins. If you think as difficulties like this, that it is a blessing from Allah, then how beautiful life would become. And instead of complaining and complaining and complaining, rather life would become so beautiful. That, ya Allah. And that's why on the Day of Judgment, the reward we will get for facing all these calamities, difficulties, it's so great that we will ask Allah, Ya Allah, I wish you made my whole life difficult. And my whole life was miserable. But we are too weak. But that was the state of Imam al kadhim That's how he resisted what we call today depression. You and I may have been depressed. In darkness, in prison, underground, no light, in chains. You would always think, why Allah, why are you doing this to me? How come? The Imam on the contrary is saying, Ya Allah. For many times, many years, I've been asking you for the privacy and the seclusion to pray for you, for your ibadah and worship. Now you've provided me with this privacy. What beautiful. SubhanAllah. He was happy. In that difficult state, he's happy. One of the Shia goes to visit him. He manages to pay people. And he gets to visit him inside. He finds the space. He starts crying. He says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, what state is this? How difficult it is. He says, don't worry. The Faraj is coming in three days. Relief is coming in three days. This Shia thinks relief is what? The release of the Imam. That's what he thinks. He did not understand what the Imam is saying. By that time, they had already fed the Imam the poison. Harun ordered the Sindhi to give him poisonous dates. So Sindhi had fed him the poisonous dates. Imam knew that. And he told this man, this Shia, in three days the relief is coming. Faraj from Allah is coming. Three days. So don't worry. So this Shia became so excited. Three days. So he goes and he tells the Shia. He tells them in three days the Imam said, relief is coming. The Imam is coming out. So the Shia gather around the prison. And the gates of the prison open. The Shia are waiting for their Imam to come out. But to their surprise, Imam did not come out on his feet. 
but rather the Imam Salamullahi Alayhi was carried by the soldiers of Harun on the Na'ash. And they came out and they said, this is the Imam of the Rafidah, the Shia. When the Shia saw that, their happiness, their joy turned into grief, turned into azar. They took the body of Imam Al-Kazim alayhi salam, gharib, alone, in Baghdad. They put his body on the bridge known as the Bridge of Baghdad for three days. The Shia were too scared to go and bury the body of their Imam. Just like his grandfather, Gharib Karbala, he also stayed there for three days. He stayed on the bridge of Baghdad for three days. And the Shia would go past in a subtle way for by the bridge. They look at their Imam and they weep in Aza. They weep in grief until they went and they told the uncle of Harun al-Rashid. They told his uncle, it looks really bad that you leave Musa ibn Ja'far on the bridge of Baghdad for so long. Do something. So his uncle, the uncle of Harun, says, okay, let's go bury him. And that's why then Harun pretended that, my gosh, Musa has been killed. So he takes off his imama and he comes and walks in the procession of Imam al-Kazim alayhi salam. Now because the uncle of Harun, Abbasi, is taking care of the ghusl and the kafan, the Shia now walk with him. So there is the procession of Imam al-Kazim salamullahi alayhi. But one of the Shia says, I saw something strange, a wonder. I saw that the one who was doing the ghusl and the kafan was Ali ibn Musa. I saw the Imam with my own eyes. People were doing the ghusl, but they were not doing the ghusl. They thought they were doing the ghusl. The one who was doing the ghusl was his son, Ali ibn Musa. The one who did the kafan was Ali ibn Musa. The one who prayed the salat was Ali ibn Musa. The one who buried was Ali ibn Musa. Salamullahi alayhi. And he was buried Gharib alone in Baghdad, where he is today, next to his grandson, Al-Imam Al-Jawad, who is also the Gharib of Baghdad. They are there until this day and age. But today, 7 million people, today as we speak, they say 7 million people are in the shrine of Imam Al-Kazim, doing the ziyarah of Imam Al-Kazim. I say, Ya Imam Al-Ridha, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, you attended the funeral, the burial of your father, Imam Al-Kazim alayhi salam. You took care of his ghusl, his kafan. You buried him. And then you went back to the family. You went back to the women, the daughters, the children of Imam Al-Kazim alayhi salam. You went back to them. You looked after them. But who was there on the day of Ashura for the Gharib of Karbala? Who was there for his women, his children? That's why Imam al Rida, his, his poet Di'bil, he says, when I recited verses of poetry reminding Imam al Rida about his aunt Zainab, the Imam burst in tears and cried, Aywa Jaddah wa Husayna. Ah, Zainab alayhi salam, the daughters of Imam al Hussein, who was there for them on the day of Ashura. Ah, Imam al Rida, you were there for the daughters of Imam al Kazim. But who was there when they put the chains and the ropes on the hands of the daughters of Abi Abdullah al Hussein in Karbala? Who was there for the little girl of Abi Abdullah in Sham, crying in the middle of the night, Father, where are you? I miss you. Crying, where is my father? Ya Imam al -Rida. no one was there to look after her when they brought her the head of her father, Abi Abdullah. And the minute she saw it, she cried and lost her life over the body, over the head of her father, crying, Aywa Abah, Aywa Hussein. 
and she was buried Gariba in Sham. Who was there for Zainab? Salam Allah alayha. As she was facing Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad and Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Who was there for her as she was surrounded by Shimr and Umar ibn Sa'd and Zajr beating her with their whips? Who was there for the daughters of Abi Abdullah al Hussein? Ah, and after three days, your father received the ghusl, a kafa, but your grandfather, Abi Abdullah, his kafan was the sand of Karbala. His ghusl was his blood that has he covered in. Imam al Sajjad comes back after three days. Salam Allah alayhim. He hugs the body of his father, Imam al Hussein, and says, Assalamu alayka ya abta Ya Abu Abdullah He finds a tribe of Bani Asad coming there When they recognize it as Imam al-Sajjad They tell him we came to bury the bodies But we don't know who's who The bodies are bodies without heads And after burying the bodies Then he came he said bring me a rug They said why do you need a rug for They said he, they crushed the body of my father Abi Abdullah al Hussein into pieces. We cannot carry him. We have to put him on a rug and put him down in the cupboard with her through a rug. He puts him down in his qabr. Then he hears a voice coming from the throat of Imam al Hussein saying, Bunay Ali wasid radi'i ala sadri. My son Ali put my baby on my chest. So he finds the baby, the body of Abdullah al Radi'i Ali al Azgar, puts him on the chest of Imam al Hussein. Salamullahi alayhim. And then they find him looking for something in the sand. What are you looking for, Ibn Rasulullah? He said, I'm looking for the finger of my father, Abi Abdullah al Hussein. When the enemy of Allah came to his body after his martyrdom, he wanted to take off his ring from his, from his, uh, from his finger. He couldn't, so he cut off the finger of Abi Abdullah to take off the ring of Mawla. So I'm looking for that finger. And he buries the finger with the body of Imam al Hussein. Salamullahi alayhim. Then he goes to the river of Furaya to the body of his uncle Abu al Fadl al Abbas. Ya am, oh my uncle Abu al Fadl, what difficulties we witnessed after you, what calamities my aunt Zainab is facing after you. Ayah, inna lillah. وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين Raise your hands in the dua brothers and sisters one of the title of الإمام الكاظم is باب الحوائج the gate of hajat the gate of needs if you have a haja inshallah your haja will be fulfilled through the blessings of Imam al-Kadhim salam Allah alayhi as we recited in his ziyara, Assalamu alayka ya nur Allah. He is the nur, the light of Allah on the darknesses of this earth. He illuminates, he shines, he radiates. And inshallah, he illuminates our hearts, inshallah. May Allah grant us a shafa'a in dunya, in the qabr, and in the akhirah, inshallah. Raise your hands, mu'mineen and mu'minat. Many mu'mineen have requested us to remember them in our dua. They have hajat, they have needs, they have some sick people. They have some needs that they want to fulfill. And we all have hajat, inshallah. Our hajat are accepted and fulfilled on this night, inshallah. Through the barakah of Bab al Hawaij. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Amman yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su. Amman yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su. Amman yujibu al-mudtar idha da'ahu wa yakshifu al-su. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ اللهم اكشف عنا السوء يا الله O oh Allah, through the greatness of Babu al-Hawaij, Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kadhim, make us and our children until the day of judgment among the sincere Shia of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. And may Allah grant us the shafa'a of Ahlul Bayt in dunya, in qabr, and in the akhirah, inshaAllah. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Babul Hawa'ij, the gate of Hajat, Musa ibn Ja'far, to accept all the Hajat of the Mu'mineen and the Mu'minat, to fulfill the Hajat of the Mu'mineen and the Mu'minat. Those who are ill, may Allah grant them quick recoveries, insha'Allah. Those who are experiencing difficulties, may Allah relieve them from their difficulties very soon, insha'Allah. رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا اجْزِهِمَا بِالْإِحْسَانِ إِحْسَانًا وَبِالسَّيِّئَاتِ غُفْرَانًا رَبِّ اجْعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَاءَ اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين لقضاء الحوائج وشفاء المرضى كشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح أمواتنا وأموات الجالسين والحاضرين والشهداء والعلماء على الخصوص إلى روح سيدنا ومولانا الإمام موسى بن جعفر الكاظم عليه السلام رحم الله من قرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات